Greetings to you all. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that are new or have been sitting in the shadows, if you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love. And also, don't forget to set your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss any new videos, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Disturbing Camping Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the very first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This experience takes place in the spring of 2018. I've had a few what could be considered paranormal experience in life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I am an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp, especially around the Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. Around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs you see on videos, but these were protruding light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. Seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light, and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating around us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and looking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep at around 1 a.m. The next morning, when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There wasn't any light in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if this is relevant info, but I thought I would add it in. Has anyone else had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. This story is about a bad experience I had when I went camping on the beach in the summer with my boyfriend. We had the nice idea of camping on the beach instead of going to a hotel, since I always wanted to sleep and hear the waves hitting the shore, see the night sky whenever I wanted, and just live this experience at least once in my life. We were supposed to stay in our tent for a week. The area had public restrooms with showers and restaurants, so the matter of hygiene and hunger were not an issue. We bought all the supplies we needed for such an adventure. A two-person tent, which was blacked out, the sun rays wouldn't come in. An inflatable mattress, a first aid kit, and lanterns for the tent, etc. The first nights were no issue. We actually enjoyed every moment of it. We would always take all of our valuables with us in a backpack, just in case anything bad were to happen to our tent phones, chargers, wallets, etc. We weren't the only people that camped in that area. There were plenty of people that would camp there, either single people, couples, or even families, which includes even people that behaved badly. 
When night came, you would occasionally hear people laughing, partying, dancing, listening to music up, smoking weed, taking drugs, or drinking a lot of alcohol. We didn't mind it as nobody had bothered anyone for the past four days and nights. People were having fun as they knew best, and no one was being aggressive to that point. On one night, we stayed out later than the usual, around 1 a.m., just wandering around the lively streets to listen to street performers, eating out and such. When we stopped at one of such street performers, who seemed to have a lot of people circling him and listening to his music, we realized he wasn't the main character the people were gathered for. In the middle of the crowded street, where cars would occasionally pass by, was a middle-aged woman dancing completely naked and clearly affected by the abuse of alcohol and or consumption of drugs. She was incoherent. She would randomly flirt with people. She would expose herself while dancing to the music, despite the disgust of the musician and the passerbyers. We didn't look too much into it and decided to leave back to our tent and just have a drink in silence while watching the stars and falling asleep to the sounds of the ocean. While drinking ourselves, we hear some lady shouting in the distance. It's the same woman we had seen before, but she was not alone. She had friends with her, two women and two men. They had a campsite on the same beach with us, a few tenants further from us, but not far enough so that we couldn't hear them or see them, even if it was dark. They lit a fire on the beach and continued to drink, smoke, and dance around it. She, of course, is still naked, but this time she is wearing a see-through skirt. She goes into the ocean to what seems to be an eternity. I remember thinking, how is she not cold? That water must be freezing. My boyfriend just shrugged and told me not to be bothered by it. If we don't engage with her or them, they wouldn't annoy us. So I did as I was told. But even so, I always felt as if we were being watched. Put my thoughts aside, we decided to go to sleep. But being a beautiful night and the air warm, we thought of not closing the tent completely. Just unzip the mosquito cover so the air would circulate inside the tent and have the sun shining in the morning to wake us up early. I don't recall how long I'd been sleeping for, but I remember being awoken by footsteps circling our tent and a womanly voice humming a song softly. The tent was not very thick. You could hear everything outside of it. I was too afraid to look out. Hell, I was too afraid to even change my position as to not indicate to the outsider that I noticed their presence. All I did was lay down and look outside through the mosquito cover. All of a sudden, I hear the footsteps stop by my head, and the voice whispered, Don't be afraid. I only want to sing you a lullaby. And the footsteps began again to circle the tent. I see her feet in front of our tent just passing by, noticing the very familiar long see-through skirt blowing behind her. The next morning, we packed our tent and moved in a different area of the beach, further away as possible from that woman and her friends. My partner was at a bachelorette party at a campground. I was not invited for reasons of being a male. The audacity, I know. But stayed up late in case anything happened. She calls me at 12 a.m., panicked, saying, He was just in here. And I had her recount everything after taking a few breaths. So, this is her story, not mine, but I was very much involved. After a fun day and night of drinking, playing games, hiking, swimming... They decided to call it a night. We will call my partner Mindy for an amenity. Mindy decided to finally take a shower after everyone else was turning in and walked to the camp bathrooms. 
She noticed an older white man sitting on a bench, but he doesn't pay her any mind listening to something on his phone. She assumed that he was waiting for someone or was just sitting on a bench at night. Campgrounds are full of strange bench sitters. It's one of those timed showers where you push a button to get water to come out, so her shower was very short, and she had brought her clothes in, so she got dressed. She heard someone else and assumed another person needed to use the shower. As she opened the curtain and sees the man peeking into shower stalls one at a time, she was the only person in there, and all she could do was stand there, mouth agape, staring at the man. He realized someone was standing there, and when he saw her, his eyes got super wide and he sprinted away. I told her that the ranger or camp staff would be nearby and to let them know immediately, or to call the police. But since she was at someone's celebration, she didn't want to disturb anything. I figured there was some shock and I didn't want to raise her anxiety by arguing. Still, neither of us slept that night as I waited for her calls and she waited for a man to break into the tent. She tells the ranger the next morning and they said, We've gotten several reports yesterday about this man, but no one can seem to find him. Flabbergasted that the man had once again caused discomfort. It seems to me that he was trying to muster courage to potentially do something worse, as it was a whole day of stalking, hiding, waiting, and sneaking into the shower stalls. But that he was still timid. I'm just glad she came home safely, and I really wished I was there because I'm the guy who would run towards explosions, literally happened once, and would love to sate my contained bloodlust by beating down a villain. As a child, I grew up in Sydney, southwest Australia, a suburb called Rose Meadow. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Well, there are no roses, and half of the suburb is housing commission and was known for being a rough area. Nevertheless, I enjoyed my childhood, and me and my friends made the most out of what we had. So, we spent a lot of time playing in the local bushland. We rode bikes, made tree swings, caught frogs, and just explored. I dare say I know that bushland like the back of my hand. There was never really anything eerie about the bush except for the fact there was a nursing home located on the western side of the bushland, upon a large hill called Kilbride Nursing Home, which security would patrol, so we got chased out of that section of the bushland quite a few times. Being the nursing home were catacomb-type structures built, as if they were going to construct another building, but never got around to finishing it. We explored these random concrete foundations with cave-like half-dirt, half-brick structures. It seemed to be used to hang out or even sleep there as we found canned food, some dirty old bongs and old clothes and just random shit. Anyway, life goes on and it's 2003 now, and I'm 14 years old. I dabbled with marijuana and thought it would be an awesome idea if me and my two friends pitched a tent on the western side of the bushland, further down a valley from the nursing home, so we weren't too close to the security car's patrol paths. I think we bought a $40 tent from Kmart, and at about 4 p.m., we hiked to the chosen location to set up the tent before the sun went down. I managed to get some weed, had a bong, and it was all three of our first times properly smoking. We were all excited, as I imagine most kids would be, when they're about to experience something new and exciting. We did not tell anyone about our plan, as we knew we were going to experiment with drugs and didn't want anyone, including our parents, finding out. The sun went down, and I remember... We had a little fire going, and we had a 
cone each. My friends were in deep conversation, and my mind drifted off as I suddenly felt a presence around us. And as if someone were watching us, my ears pricked up, and I felt super sensitive, thinking I could hear rustling in the distance, but wasn't quite sure. My two friends were having a great old time giggling like schoolgirls as they sat across the fire from me. Blame it on the weed, but I got paranoid and flailed my arms around and sternly let out a shh to my friends. They looked at me like, what the fuck? And I whispered, did you hear that? And before I could finish my sentence, an eerie voice howled from the darkness, piercingly loud. I know where you are. I was shocked and glared at my friends to gauge their reactions because surely they heard that too. And yep, after about two seconds, all of us frozen in shock, we all jolted up and our instincts just had us running back towards the nursing home to exit the bushland. Whilst running, I saw a large, dark silhouette figure of what resembled someone in a cloak like a grim reaper standing on top of the catacomb, half-built infant structures as we ran through the valley. When I saw the figure, I remember thinking, what the fuck, but wasn't going to stop to investigate it anymore. We finally reached the exit to the bushland and looked back in relief and confusion at the bush, in which point we all saw a white apparition at the bottom of the hill coming towards us. We continued to run back to my house as it was close to the bushland. I got affirmed by my friends that that just happened and we all experienced the same thing. Pretty sure we just slept at my house that night, not wanting to go back to the bush until the sun was out. The next day we went back to the tent and cleaned up our mess and although we had a bad experience during the night, playing in the bush was our thing, so we continued to enjoy it during light hours. As we were playing by the tree swing, which was about 15 meters away from where we had a tent the night before, we suddenly hear the shrieks and screams from what sounded like a young girl, who then yelped, Help me! And then the sound of someone starting up a chainsaw. I looked over to the mound of where the tree swing was, but couldn't see much through the thick shrub. I didn't even think people could get to that side of the bush, as there was no flat ground or pathways, just thick bushland. So once again, we all ran back to my house and got my dad to bring my dog and come help us search. What was very bizarre was that when we reached my house, there was an old Chinese man riding his bike around the front of my house who wore a bucket on his head as a helmet. I had seen that guy around town before and just always thought, ha, how strange he wears a bucket. But this time he was riding right near my house, kind of just circling around and the look he gave me made me feel extremely uncomfortable. We took my dog down to the bush and again found nothing. These experiments have made me wonder and think, sometimes even question me and my friend's sanity. Were we all going through the same psychosis? Was the Chinese bucket hat man mystical in some way and fucked with us for fun? Who yelled out to us? Who was the girl screaming? Was there actually a crazed maniac with a chainsaw ready to slaughter her? Does the nursing home hold dark energies and entities that play tricks on people in this bushland? To this day, I will not know the truth, but it was all just very strange. If anyone who listens to this knows Rose Meadow Bush and has had similar experiences, please, 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 let me know.
A little history and setup of the village I grew up in for context. The village I lived in was only about 40 to 50 people at most. Everyone knew everyone. All 12 of us kids knew each other and played with each other. Naturally, some of us grouped together and explored the surrounding area, since there wasn't much in the way of entertainment back then, mid to late 90s, in rural Ohio. The village was old, back in the late 1790s as a small trading hub for the local area. Ohio didn't become a state until 1803. My village was a single church in the center of it, an old schoolhouse converted into an actual house just next to it and pasture behind it with thick woods surrounding three of the four sides of our small town. Again, as said prior, my dad grew up around the area, so he was full of legends and stories about the place. One of those stories was about a small fort that was originally French turned British, and finally colonial American in the area. Nobody really knew where exactly it was located, but there was a few mentions of a small fort in the area from the research I had done. One of the stories about this fort was that it was a primary trade route for the local native tribes and the influx of settlers that were arriving in the area. Naturally, conflicts arose as more and more people settled the surrounding area and eventually all out conflict ensued between the settlers and the native tribes. The fort was said to be destroyed by fire. People on both sides slaughtered each other and eventually the natives were driven from the area with the help of a local militia. My dad always told me that the land was not good, tainted in ways with bad energy. I guess where entire families were slaughtered and people being driven from their homeland, it can cause some long-term ill effects. When all of us kids were playing, we were always told two things. One, if the woods get quiet, you get quiet and leave immediately. Two, if your name is being called out and you're way out in the woods, do not respond. Go home immediately and never look back. Pretend you never heard it to begin with. Everyone in the village knew how quirky the area was. Most days were the usual bland days, while some days it was like a fairy tale. Periodically, other days, it could be a straight up nightmare. Now, the people of the woods were probably the most common entity everyone in the village knew of and were generally treated with respect and a wide berth. Some of the other things were generally best left well enough alone entirely. Okay, so here's my experience. In the late 90s, I was around 10 years old when I was overcome with an insatiable desire to go camping. It was mid-August, so hot and muggy during the day, but rather mild and cool at night. I gathered two of my friends and told them about it, and they both liked the idea. Now, generally nobody really camped in our woods. My parents, along with many others, really didn't like the idea of a group of 10 and 11-year-olds going camping alone. My dad said we could, as long as he came with us, just to ensure we were safe. I reluctantly agreed. Prior to that night, I went out to scout out a good area to make camp at, and I knew of a fairly decent place that was close to the creek, relatively flat and not too difficult to get to. I wanted to scout the area just to ensure it was cleared of debris and ready for tents. By this time, I was well acquainted with the people of the woods, and I made my offering before entering the woods. I didn't see them while on my journey or anything, so I felt pretty good about it. Once I arrived to the location, I began moving things around, clearing out the sticks, large stones, and made a fire pit. Even going as far as stacking it with wood and throwing some larger sticks nearby for fuel for later. 
I was so enthralled in what I was doing and so focused on getting the area cleared out that by the time I was satisfied with what I had done, I just noticed just how quiet everything around me became. When I say quiet, I mean dead silent. No birds, bugs, not even the wind made a noise amongst the leaf litter. I immediately shut down everything I was doing. I stood there looking around, slowing my breathing, and just trying to listen for the faintest sound I could hear. I don't know how long I stood there motionless. A few minutes, maybe, and then in the far distance, I could hear a crew call, and almost immediately, I began hearing the chirping of robins and even a faint whistling from the wind in the trees. The hair on my arms and neck were on end, and I figured, well, maybe it was just me making a ruckus that everything nearby quieted down because of that. Content with that logical reasoning, I began making my way back home to pack for the night. Around 6 p.m. that night, my two friends made their way over with backpacks, tents, and both me and my dad were finishing up dinner. All four of us made ready with everything we needed and began trekking out to the site I had prepared. Nothing all that noteworthy happened going to the site, even after setting up our tent, lighting the fire and making s'mores. It was shaping up to be a pretty fun night and rather enjoyable. Once we started to get ready to crawl into our tents for the night at around 10 to 11 p.m., the wind started to pick up and my dad said we might be in for some rain, but he didn't seem to have a look of contentment. My dad loves the rain. On his face when he said it, it was like he felt something was off and it wasn't long that all of us started to feel that way. We all ended up crawling into our tent anyways since it was night and possible rain incoming checking back home would have sucked. We should have walked back. We situated ourselves in our tents in a half circle around the fire pit, which all were facing the creek and the back of the tents facing the woodland. My dad was to the left of me in his military surplus tent, me in the cheapo Walmart single person tent, just barely large enough for me, and my two friends to my right in their own tent. The wind howled for some time, half an hour to an hour before it calmed down. Then it got quiet. No cricket, no wind, no wildlife. The creek itself, which usually bubbles happily along, sounded muted. All we had was the faint glow of embers from the fire pit in front of our tent, casting a warm glow. I could hear my heart throb in my ears, and I knew my dad and two friends were just as anxious as I was. I could hear them shift uncomfortably. I heard one of my friend's tent zipper, and naturally I undid my zipper too, to see what was going on. As soon as I popped my head out to look, I seen my dad come out of his tent with the machete he had, and he faced the wood line. My friend had his head poking out too and asked if I had heard that noise. I didn't hear anything. My heart was pounding so hard, it was hard hearing him even whisper. We both partially got out of the tent to see what my dad was looking at, but all we could see was inky darkness. And then I heard it, a distant and faint, Hello? It was coming from some ways away in the darkness of the woods. I could see my dad shift uncomfortably on his feet, white-knuckling his machete, looking into the wood line. Then again, the voice called out, Hello? It didn't seem right, just off-putting, almost as if whoever was speaking was trying to speak in a very feminine voice, faint and fragile. My dad mentioned me to grab some of the extra wood next to his tent and throw it on the fire, which I reluctantly did. Leaving the perceived safety of my tent didn't sit well with me, 
as the fire began to slowly grow in brightness. My dad stepped backwards near the fire and stood there facing the wood line. By this time, my other friend popped his head out of his tent too, and all three of us, including my dad, were watching the wood line unsure of what to expect. Nothing came out and we didn't hear the voice again. An hour passed and by this time, my dad was sitting on a large stone next to his tent, one leg crossed and a machete in his right hand, watching silently. Only the sound of crackling fire echoing against the shell cliff face crossed the creek. Several hours passed and both of my friends went back into their tents. Only me and my dad were out. Me tending the fire and my dad watching and waiting. I could hear rustling to our right, just beyond the light from the fire in the tree line. My friend closest to it popped his head out, looked at me and asked, What? As if he was wanting me to repeat what I said. I didn't say a word. Hadn't said a word since I came out of my tent the first time. I put my finger to my lips and motioned him to be quiet. By the time I did so, my dad was standing next to me and told us both to shush. And immediately, we heard someone say, Come here. In the same off-putting, feminine voice as earlier. All three of us just stood there peering in the direction of where the voice came from, and shortly after, we heard what sounded like something moved back deeper into the woods. It didn't sound heavy, it didn't sound light, like something lightly trotting back into the woods. That was the last time we heard it. Shortly after, I'm assuming early morning, just before daybreak, the wood life returned. Crickets, the distant chirp of birds, and the whisper from the winds through the leaves. Once daybreak came, we all broke down our tents, packed up, and began hiking back home. We were paranoid the entire way back, stopping, listening, looking. We didn't see or hear anything or anyone. Nobody said a word on the way back. Once we made it to my backyard, my dad broke the silence and told us that what we experienced never happened and it would do us good not to say a word to anyone about it. He had fear written all over his face as if not even he had experienced something like this. To this day, I don't know what it was or who it was. I did end up asking my aunt next door later in life if she experienced something similar since she grew up in the area too, but even she was tight-lipped about it, saying we shouldn't have gone camping out there, and my dad was a fool for letting us go. I have since left my village and moved out of state, and I have ran into similar stories down here in the south and east, with the same reluctant to explain what it was or could be. So if anyone could enlighten me, I'm all ears. I've told this story probably over a hundred times, and despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate what makes for a great story. So, I'm going to share it with you. I could start by saying that I always hated going camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, however, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but we were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights, we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip 
was a time where the counselors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. What I didn't know, however, was that the events of that camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods again. The trip began as any other. All together, there were around 30 people on this trip. Four counselors in training, four counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 14. Walking in a single file line up and down the various trails, you could hardly hear any sounds of nature over the conversations and laughter of the campers. Several hours went by and we made our way through a dense, marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training, Jordan, as well as two campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us just started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers, until the last of them faded out of view around a bend about 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off, and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire, and the other half appeared to have been killed by a disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated with a small derelict cabin sitting in the middle of the scorched forest, but seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through this area. We were so enraptured by the scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned around to look at where the sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us was a haggard-looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a long black beard slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked on us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him, and we had no idea how long he had been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, Come on, let's speed up and get back to the rest of the group. As we turned to continue on our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. The man muttered again, slightly louder, Um, are you going camping? Jordan answered the man that, yes, we are going camping, to which the man smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, Hmm, you better be careful. <laughs> we nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on to try to find the rest of the group, this time with a much faster pace although the man had been walking up the same trail as us. When we saw him, he didn't continue, but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail, watching us as we made our way up the winding path and disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up to the rest of the group who had been waiting for us, and we told the adult counselors about our interaction with the man. They just shrugged it off, telling us that the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we are doing nearby on his property. Still, I felt unnerved by the encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man had somehow followed us. Eventually, though, I put it out of my mind and managed to enjoy myself just a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed, and Jordan and the other counselor in training from the boys' cabin had brought two warm Mike's harders that they had stolen from the counselor's quarters. 
and I took out a joint I had stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint, and we made our way to the edge of the river where we had washed our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and the thought of the man from earlier kept popping into my head. Assuming that I was cold, not anxious, Jordan gave me his blue hoodie and then prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night so I could sleep in the same tent with him and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this and after smoking that joint, we made our way back to our tent, which were pitched slightly away from the others and we discreetly sipped on the Mike Harders while telling ghost camping stories. Some time passed and one of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly making up on the spot when he suddenly stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away near one of our other camper's tents. As we strained to listen to what was going on, the noises stopped, and even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom, being stoned and hyped up on scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide in our tent. Jordan followed suit and we awkwardly made out before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sounds of footsteps walking around near my tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quieted my breathing. From the sound, it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of my tent, seemingly pacing back and forth. I turned to wake up Jordan, but... I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one I had been hearing, I closed my eyes and I was just beginning to drift back to sleep when I heard the tent unzip. I felt Jordan lie down next to me and after a few moments he put his arms around me and began to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realized I had to go to the bathroom and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over, pulling his hoodie up over his head before going still again. Quietly, so as not to wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement. Comforting myself that Jordan had just gone to pee and was fine, I put my shoes on and began making the trek across our campsite to the designated P area. I had just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite, as if someone was rummaging through our supplies and bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull my pants up and, in my haste, I lost my balance and tried to catch myself with a branch that made a loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes, and the light was getting bigger, so whoever it was, they were coming toward me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got ten feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, Sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Uh, have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers might have stolen it from my bag when I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out. But, but you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. 
What he said next made my blood run cold. Uh, what are you talking about? He said. It's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if I had left it by, you know, by accident. But after I couldn't find it, I thought I'd check the boys' bags, and then when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror, as I realized that the man who got in the tent with me just moments prior hadn't been Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened, and I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent, and when Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow lying still inside our tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur, but we ran to the pod of tent on the other side of the campground, where the older counselors were sleeping, and frantically unzipped their tent and started yelling for them to come out, because there was some man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselor slowly and groggily woke up, but after a bit more of a frantic yelling, they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation. When a commotion broke out on the other side of the camp near our tent, by the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, we heard the counselors radioing back down to the camp to call the police, and we could tell that they were just as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept after that. Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come back up, and by that time, a few of the other counselors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, one of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path, like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want the hoodie back, and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy that we ran into earlier on the trail, but his face and that night still haunts me to this day. In my hometown, there's a huge lake. This place was big and desolate. I do for camping and fishing and hunting. I live in Norway, and we have something called every man's right, which basically says that you can roam free wherever you want in the country as long as it's not private property. For this reason, Norwegians love to walk around in nature, and where there is more than enough room for everyone, people usually don't accumulate. My friend and I were planning a camping trip. We were going to head up the river by boat and go to an island in the middle of the lake. When we got there, we found an ideal spot. The place had probably been inhabited by campers before us. One thing that creeped me out a bit was a northern pike's head hanging in a tree by a fireplace. It was huge, and it looked down on the camping site with its dead and dried eyes. Anyways, the real thing happened after dark. We had been sitting around the campfire for hours, eating, drinking, and just talking shit. This happened in the summer, and summers in Norway are not very dark due to its placement on Earth. But at around 1 to 2 a.m., it was quite dark. But still, I noticed something on the lake. I couldn't make out what it was, and I didn't really care. After a while, we went to our tents and went to sleep. I had some very strange dreams that night. I saw the pike. It was moving its eyes, making sounds. The skies were changing colors. 
I saw a man on the lake. The water evaporated and precipitated down again. The pike said something and laughed. Suddenly, I woke up. I was sweating. I looked around. I looked at my phone. It was still nighttime. I was only 14, so my brain wasn't fully developed yet. And underage drinking certainly didn't help. But I was afraid. I had no idea why. It was the kind of fright that you just don't want to see something. I didn't want to open the tent. I just laid completely still and pretended to be asleep. I heard noises. Noises from the dream. Noises that the head of the tree out there had made. I became stiff. I could hear the blood pumping throughout my body. I heard people shouting. The noises were no more than a hundred meters away. It was more like a hundred meters to land, and the island we stayed on was small. You could probably walk around it in five minutes. The human voices continued. They were shouting and laughing. The laughter is what got to me. It was like this kind of ugly laughter. Didn't sound like people were having fun. At some point, it felt like someone was walking toward our campsite. I was scared shitless and just laid completely still. At some point, I must have fallen asleep again. I woke up early the next morning. My friend was also up. I asked him if he had heard the noises. He had not. I wondered if it was all a dream. Then I saw something on the lake. A man. He was just standing there on some type of crude raft, probably about 200 meters away from us, I would say. He looked our way. I couldn't make out any facial features. He looked pale. My heart started pounding. The man stood out there for hours. We got so creeped out that we eventually packed our stuff and went home. Luckily, we had a motorboat, so he could never catch up to us. I still remember the way he looked at us as we left the lake and went into the river. He just stood there. Then it dawned on me. What I saw on the lake in the darkness the night before was probably him. He had been standing there all that time. Was he responsible for the voices I heard? I knew that we weren't alone on that small island, and this wasn't really a place where drunk teenagers went on a spontaneous trip in the middle of the night. Did he place that fish head in that tree to scare off people? Did we step on his sacred ground or something? And maybe most importantly, why was he standing on a raft out there on the lake? Did he set foot on the island while we were sleeping? Was he planning to do anything to us? And who was he shouting and laughing at? I don't know, and I haven't been back there since. Me and my friend both still get a little creeped out whenever someone mentions the Raft Man. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, disturbing camping stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Christy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Les Crispin, Patty Sneeze, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every last one of you for your continued support of Back to Ashes. For without you, there would not be a me, and there would definitely not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.